<laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Daniel Peterson. I actually have seen some of you before from a lot of new faces, so I hope um, you guys are enjoying yourselves. I work at Trust You, although the, the work I'm describing today is work I've been doing for really for my PhD work, so uh, not actually a Trust You business application. Still, hopefully, something that you guys will be able to learn. Um, I'm talking about Bayesian semantics, and in particular, verb sense induction. So um, we've got some idea that uh, well, I'm going um, I'm I'm to first describe to you sense induction as clustering, and then talk about Bayesian non-parametric clustering, and introduce a verb sense mixture model to do sense induction. So what do we mean by verb senses? I'm gonna, I've got an example here of a felicitous verb, enter, and a few different sentences that feature this verb. Um, Ryan enters Dusseldorf in the South is qualitatively a different kind of enter than when John enters his essay in a competition or when uh, you know you enter a classroom or more. Right? <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> these different senses of enter, we can say, um, are labeled now. We've colored each of the different oh what buttons are working. Yeah. Hey, great. <laughs> 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 Alright, so um, entering Dusseldorf from the south is the way a pack enters. Um, these two are the way uh, you enter an organization, it's more related to join. This one is enter, um, which is to say, uh, more like in a, in, a, in a competitive sense, I don't really have a, a good synonym for entering in competition. Um, and that these enters are more like walk into or something like that. So uh, we've got these identified senses. What's really cool about this, though, is that if we were given this set of sentences, we would all be able to generate this idea that these are the different senses there are, that these two are pretty much the same, these two are pretty much the same, and that there are four senses here. This is basically the path. We're going to label the senses from the corpus. Uh, with limited prior knowledge and no labeled corpus examples whatsoever, an unknown number of senses is a big cluster. So, we've got sentences, we're going to cluster them, and those clusters are going to be the senses of this verb. Okay? So, uh, it's a straightforward thing that we need to do, um, and it's going to help us whenever we're going to do semantics later, trying to understand the meaning of a sentence, we need to understand the meaning of the verb pretty well, and making these kinds of distinctions turns out to be really useful. So, um, let's talk about how we do clustering. So, you may have heard of a Chinese restaurant process, or a Dirichlet process, or a stick breaking process. These are all kind of equivalent mathematical constructions. My favorite analogy for it is polia's urn. And the reason for this is that I think it makes way more sense than the Chinese restaurant. Um, <laughs> so, um, we're going to add colored balls to an urn, okay? And we've, we've got an urn, we're going to add things to it, and the color is going to be the cluster assignment, just like it was on the slide, you know, three slides back. So, we're going to first add a new item to our set in the universe, and we're going to have to select what color or what cluster it belongs to. And we're first going to select the color based on the state of the urn as it is. So we draw from the urn, note the color, and replace that ball. Using that color, we add a new instance to our clustering. So at the, at the nth step, we're adding the nth ball. There are n minus 1 balls in the urn. We're going to draw one of them, note the color, put it back, and then add the nth ball. So each time, uh, we're drawing with replacement and then, and then adding a new thing. The urn starts off with some number, alpha, of black balls already inside of it. And whenever we see a black ball, it's a special thing that says, oh, use a color we've never seen before. So in fact, um, the ball starts off with alpha, and the end, the end, in the end step, there are n minus 1 plus alpha balls in the urn. So this is how the um, polio's urn scheme works. Does anyone have any questions about this? So, the chance of selecting a color K. Yeah? Does that mean that this slide, when you define how many clusters do we have in the end? 
the alpha does not define how many clusters you have at the end. How likely is Exactly. How likely at each step are you to choose a new cluster? Um, so here we have the probability of a selected color K being proportional to the count of how many times we've already seen that color K in the urn, um, if it's already there. Otherwise, it's proportional to alpha. So as we, and to turn these proportional probabilities into proper probabilities, what we need to do is divide by the number of balls in the urn plus alpha. So you can see that the chance of choosing a new color decreases over time as the urn gets more and more full because this fixed alpha is not growing. It's not a, it's not a fixed proportion. It's a, it's a fixed number of balls, right? Uh, so this is how we're going to do it. Uh, the Daniel, yeah. if you uh, explain it briefly again, because yeah. I think I mi missed some important concept. Sure. So, like, initially there are alpha balls, black. Yes. And then you begin to draw, you begin to put a random color into it. Yes, you're going to you're gonna put a new color, put a new ball in. Okay, then you draw again. Okay. Yeah. To, in order to choose what color of ball to use, we first draw from the urn. Note the color of the one we drew, and then replace. But initially, they're only black colors. Exactly, and so the first time, the first time we're going to put something in, we're going to draw. We know for sure a black ball because there's only black balls in there. Okay. We'll choose a new color, okay, and which is to say, start a new cluster. Okay. Say it's red. We put red in the urn, and now there's one ball, one red ball, and alpha black balls. Mm -hmm. The next step, we'll either draw a red ball, mm -hmm. in which case the next ball we put in will be. Also red, there'll be two red balls and still alpha black balls, or it will be black. And we'll have a new cluster, say a new color green, put that in there, right? So this clustering process um, will keep adding over time. Uh, and we can calculate the chances that we're going to choose a particular ball because that is basically chosen by sampling from the urn with replacement. Okay, so if you draw a red ball, you're going to put inside the urn the red ball again. Yes. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Cool. All right. Uh, sorry. Alpha is the total <laughs> amount of black balls, which is known at the start. Right? Known at the start. Yeah. This is a hyperparameter. <laughs> okay. Um, it's almost always set to be one. Okay. So, uh, uh, there's a black ball in the urn, but but there's there's yeah. alpha black balls. In the yeah. Alpha black balls. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, this is also called the Chinese restaurant process because there's another way you can have this analogy where Say that you're at a, at a Chinese restaurant where the host is going to seat you sometimes with strangers. Okay? This, there, ex, there exist restaurants like this. They're less common, I think. But apparently, uh, this is a normal thing where you know, there's some table. Uh, the host is going to seat new customers one at a time. And he's going to choose the tables that, have, that are the most popular so far. He has some fixed probability of seating you at a new table. Or, you know, just basically he follows this exact same. Uh, mathematical description and how we seat people at a table. That requires you to imagine an infinite number of tables of infinite capacity in some Chinese restaurant with a very weird host. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I like polio's urn, but theoretically there's no restriction on alpha to be mathematical, to be integer. So the urn kind of wants you to say there's one, two, maybe three balls in the urn. But you could use alpha equals 0.1, right, for, for, for the proportional sampling scheme I just described. Um, what's really nice about this is that it's infinite in some sense. There is no upper bound on the number of clusters possible. As we add new data, we can always choose to use a new cluster. But much more importantly, it's also conservative. It has a rich get richer effect where if you have uh, an urn with a million red balls in it, you are a million times more likely to use red than you are to start a new cluster, assuming alpha was one, right? So you're not going to use too many clusters to, de to describe your data, and um, this rich litter effect puts a prior that keeps the number of clusters down, <coughs> right? So uh, this is a way to say we don't know how many clusters there are exactly, there's no upper bound, but there's not too many, and this is how we use it. Um, and that fits into the, pa the paradigm of Bayesian cluster. We're actually going to use um, Bayes rules. Uh, I was pointed out earlier that this should be x given k and u. 
but this is like standard Bayes rule, right? If we have a conditional probability, we can say that's proportional to the, 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 the conditional probability, probably we're going to choose a cluster K given some data X, and the earn U is going to be proportional to the probability of choosing that color given the state of the earn times the probability of you generating X from that, from that cluster K, right? So this is the Bayesian framework. We need to compute this uh, for all possible k, which there are some number already there, and then there's also the, the chance of choosing k new, right, with the new cluster. Um, and the first factor is exactly given by the proportional uh, Chinese restaurant process or polyas or scheme we had before. So um, we introduce now a prior idea. The clustering will use a small number of clusters. An arbitrarily large, but still conservatively small number of clusters. So uh, the second factor is how we're going to encode our intuitions about the data. We want like items to be paired together. If you're sitting at a table at a Chinese restaurant, you want to be sitting with your friends, right? And so we need to describe how much alike uh, a data point is to the rest of the cluster that we have in some given state. Um, and we're going to do this with Gibbs sampling um, because it gives us a really nice way to iteratively update our assignments. So we're basically, Gibbs sampling is like a random walker. Um, you're going to end up trying to find a complete cluster assignment. But the problem is that there's a lot, a lot of possible clusterings of any given data set. Let's say we're trying to cluster some, even, even a thousand items into an up to infinite number of clusters. In the worst case, uh, we use a thousand clusters, one for each item. And there's also a case where we use all, all items in the same cluster. Those are two kind of degenerate clustering. And every single possibility of partitioning the data in between is a possible, is, is, is a way that we could do a clustering and has some likelihood of being generated by the Dirichlet process. Um, and probably any other process we could describe. But if we define our data right, most of those clusterings are going to be just terrible where you've got stuff that is going to be absolutely looking like it was randomly grouped together with no sense, no rhyme, no reason. And this is actually the part we're going to leverage. Because if most possible clusterings are terrible, we only need to find a clustering that looks reasonably likely under this first part of the equation here. Probably the clustering given, um, given the data and uh, our knowledge, our, our prior idea about what the cluster will look like. So, if we can draw from the overall posterior distribution, we're good. Gibbs sampling will let us do that. We have to take one variable at a time, and it basically is like a random walker who takes one step. And you let this random walker go so that every step he makes is locally sensible um, according to some probability distribution, and over a long enough time, he will walk to a place that's globally sensible. So after some burn-in period, it doesn't matter where we started, we're going to end up in a place where there's relatively high probability. And so if we don't need to worry about where we started, we can initialize this entire clustering randomly, use Gibbs sampling, and uh, we'll get good results in there. You guys have seen Gibbs sampling before? Good. Uh, now. Let's put this together into a verb sense mixture model. Uh, I'm going to say we've got dependency parse sentences. We know the verb. We also know the slots, subject, direct object, preposition, whatever, whatever parts came out of it. Um, and we're going to assume that shared context words suggest the same sense. So if two sentences have the same uh, object, they're likely to be in the same sense. If they have the same subject, they're likely to be in the same sense. Uh, and that uh, each cluster has a higher likelihood to generate its frequent established arguments. So we can describe a cluster by the kinds of vocabulary that are slot, token, pairs that it generates. So, like I say, a cluster is multinomial distribution over slot, token, pairs. Um, and these distributions are drawn from a Dirichlet prior with a small uniform parameter beta. So this looks like topic modeling. Uh, sorry? Yes? What is the slot here? 
Uh, slot is a dependency parse slot, so it's a syntactic slot. So okay. um, it could be subject, direct object, uh, prepositional object, adverb, modifier, things like that. But they're um, just going to be the direct syntactic dependencies of the verb, which is the root of it. And we're only using verbs because um, that's what I was working on for my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. My advice is probably the better argument for just words than I do, but yeah, those are the, the, the slots. Um, and so we're going to treat each of those slot token pairs as an independent vocabulary item, and we're going to treat a cluster as having a multinomial distribution over those vocabulary items, with drawn from a hearsay prior parameter beta. So updating the probability of drawing an instance going to be the probability of W, which are slot token pairs inside the instance, the count of that vocabulary item inside the cluster, plus beta, and then normalized appropriately. So this is the exact same way we would say, see if a word has some probability of being drawn from a topic in LDA. Right? And this is our Dirichlet process mixture model then. So we've got some Dirichlet process G with the parameter alpha, which is always one. And then we have m distinct verb instances we're going to cluster. Each of them has n distinct word, like slot token w's in it. Those are going to be drawn from the cluster specific b, which has got a prior of beta. So this looks kind of like LDA, except without the extra layer of nesting that's required for us to do uh, document specific groupings, right? This is basically a simplified version of the LDA model with a non-parametric prior up here. So uh, this is a nice, straightforward application of principles that you've seen in other places, I hope. And if not, you will see when you read LDA. Um, a few things we've done to speed things up um, are when I say we want things that are like to be together, um, we went ahead and in some sensible order for verb valency, initially combine things. So all subjects, I mean like all verbs that have the same exact uh, slot token um, argument, if they have the same direct object, they are in the same cluster to start with. If they have the same subject, they are in the same cluster to start with. And we did it in some order so that um, say having the same direct object takes precedence in the initial clustering over uh, having the same subject um, and then we've also discarded the initial frames that didn't gather enough counts into them to get started. So that was the initial clustering. And that reduced the number of things you have to cluster and kind of gave us a head start giving teeth into the problem. And I've got some senses. This is a web corpus of over a billion web pages. And these are senses of enter 4 of 37 that I will show you um, that uh, we've, we've generated through this method. So. Um, the way to read this is that this is a gloss of the vocabulary inside the cluster. So the vocabulary distribution over slot token pairs and simplified by adding a slot to the left side and then these are the corresponding tokens, slot and tokens, and these are just the counts. So um, n sub name means uh, having a count of 60,000 means there are 60,000 instances in this cluster that had n sub name. In. Name is just a shorthand for name entity. We didn't do any name entity types, but we thought it was worth doing. So this is a cluster of enter where you are joining some sort of agreement or negotiation. Um, so this is a kind of enter into a contract sense of enter, which is clean and looks nice and also is a sensible way to say there, there is such an enter sense. Uh, since two, we've got, um, again, people that's the most common thing that enters. Um, are entering schools, college, or, or a land? This one is probably the wrong sense, but um, the name that to be in school, we've got entering is more like joining in this sense, and it's fairly clean. Um, and the next one, in sense three, we've got people entering houses, buildings, and homes. They're coming through the door in the window 
and through some <laughs> <laughs> That's not nearly as alarming as the next sense where the same people are coming in to the room in the office, but they've got guns. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you can see that this is kind of overloaded, right? But this is still people entering rooms, um, people entering, and it's the same sense of enter, but uh, we've got different, we've got slightly different valences. So uh, takeaways are that the senses are fairly fine grained. Uh, a lot of times they duplicate one another. There are 37 senses in the corpus that we automatically induced. I don't believe there are 37 different kinds of entering. So um, we've got some duplication. And then there's also a little bit of noise because Gibbs sampling is a random process. We're trying to end up in a region that's relatively likely, not come up with a maximum. Um, and the fact that we're not ever trying to maximize means we can't get stuck in local optima, but it also means we don't end up in quite as nice a place as we potentially could. So um, that's the talk. I've got plenty of time for questions, I hope. Yeah. Yes. Cool. <laughs> yeah.